It's such a privilege to be able to serve at that kind of level in the U.S. government and to work with great leaders. The challenges and the difficulties of being president of the United States are truly extraordinary. And we've been privileged to have many great people serve in that role. And I've been privileged to serve with two great presidents and honored to be able to do so. I think the problem right now is that we have broadly accepted this idea that the relationship with China is a competition. But the fact is that in the zero-sum world of international politics, competition is zero-sum. And it's very hard to put boundaries or guardrails, the way the administration wants to say, on the relationship when you define the relationship as zero-sum. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute. And today I'm speaking with Jim Steinberg. Jim is the 10th Dean of John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Prior to becoming the Dean of SICE, Jim served as a university professor of social science, international affairs and law at Syracuse University and served as Dean of Syracuse's Maxwell School from July 2011 until June 2016. He previously served as Deputy Secretary of State from 2009 to 2011, serving as a Principal Deputy to Secretary Clinton. Jim also served as Deputy National Security Advisor to President Clinton from 1996 to 2000, and as the President's personal representative to the 1998 and 1999 G8 summits. Prior to becoming Deputy National Security Advisor, Jim served as Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff and as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Analysis at the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Jim, welcome to the podcast. I always learn something new from you when we talk. I'm a big admirer of what you're building at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. And I'd like to start at the beginning. You were born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. Talk a bit about your upbringing and what sparked your early interest in public policy, because boy, you started early. Thanks, Hank, and it's a great pleasure to be with you too. You know, mentioning Boston is really very uh, relevant to the answer to that question because I did grow up in Boston and very early on, we were exposed to a, a very dynamic uh, young senator named John F. Kennedy, who was uh, our senator in the, the 1950s. And one of my first memories as a, as a young boy was the inauguration of President Kennedy um, in 1961 and the remarkable uh, speech that he gave then. And I think for a young person growing up in Boston and seeing this, this dynamic leader talking about the future really inspired me and I think many others with this sort of powerful sense of both the opportunities and the responsibility of, of public service. And that sort of stuck with me and really kind of was kind of a, a motivation throughout the rest of my life. Yeah. And, and so then you got involved very early on, at least it's, to me, it seemed early in public policy. But before you were known as a foreign policy luminary, you built your chops with a range of local political campaigns. How did this evolve? And then how did it evolve into national politics? Well, as you said, I mean, I think especially, you know, for somebody who grew up in sort of a middle class family, the, it was the it was the day to day issues. And particularly growing up in Boston, which so I think some of your listeners will know was a very contentious time in social policy. We had uh, a lot of issues around race and, and economic issues in the city uh, in the 1960s. Um, and I had the chance when I was a senior in high school after, my, after I graduated from high school to work as an intern for the first black city councilor in Boston, Tom Atkins, who was an extraordinary leader, a very courageous and, and brilliant man. Uh, and then when I went to college, I worked both part-time during the school year and during the summers for Kevin White, who was the mayor of Boston. And so I was working on all the issues that were kind of close to home for me, housing, health, transportation, and the like. But there was a there was this sort of funny moment of enlightenment, which was, though I'd always thought about working on the local level, I was working for uh, Mayor White in uh, 1972, in the summer of 1972. And uh, George McGovern had just been nominated as the Democratic candidate for president. And there was a brief period of time where the McGovern campaign reached out to Mayor White 
to explore whether Kevin might be willing to join the ticket as the vice presidential candidate. And for the first time for all of us you know, who were working there, our little world of Boston and Massachusetts politics it seemed to open up to the possibility of the of the national stage. And though, as you know, it didn't turn out that way, and that, that ultimately McGovern picked uh, Sarge Shriver to be the vice presidential candidate. There was sort of this sense of, you know, we at the at the city and local level were so dependent on the national government that maybe if we could just raise our sights and be part of that conversation. And a small sidebar to that is, uh, as very few people will know, but it was a very important personal legacy, was the chief of staff to Kevin White at that time was a young man named Barney Frank. And so, you know, it was my first association with what became Congressman Frank, and also my first sense about the possibilities of taking that local work and to achieve local things through national efforts. Amazing, a small world, because when I went to Washington to be George W. Bush's Treasury Secretary, and as I got to know him, I became very close to him, and he was tremendously effective in getting things done that we needed to get done and was a really good colleague as we went through the financial crisis. To take on your narrative, you were serving in the Justice Department of the Carter administration. So you'd now go on to the national level. You were at the Justice Department of the Carter administration when you made the pivotal career shift to foreign policy. So describe how that shift began and how it sparked a change in your career. Because Jim, you always were interested in service, but to make the shift to foreign policy, that was a big shift. Absolutely. You know, I, and so I, I, I was privileged enough to join the Carter administration in the first year of the Carter administration, where I worked um, at what was then the Department of Health, Education and Welfare for Secretary Califano, which was a, a great and extraordinary experience. Then I went back, I finished law school and, and clerked and then went to the Justice Department. And I had one of those classic Washington jack of all trades jobs for, for junior people, which I was a special assistant to the head of the civil division at the Justice Department. For those of you who know how justice works, civil sort of handles the litigation for all the different federal agencies. So you have to kind of cover a lot of different ground. But when you're a special assistant, your main job is not that you really know anything, but you're willing to work long hours and, and weekends. And I happened to be in the office on the morning of November 4th, 1979, very early in the morning. And I was there before my boss, the assistant attorney general, got in. And there were sort of phones that connected between the attorney general's office and each of his principal assistants. And that early Sunday morning, the phone rang and I picked it up because that's what special assistants do. And I told the attorney general that the AAG wasn't there, but could I help? And he asked me to come up to his office to join some other people because we had just learned that the Iranians had taken the Americans hostages in Tehran and that he had to go to the White House and, and present the views about what the U.S. should do. And I didn't know very much about it, but I sort of had some sense about the kinds of tools that the Justice Department had and, and the like. And so as a result of that sort of chance moment, I was put on a team of people who were supporting both the Justice Department and the administration as a whole on dealing with the Iranian crisis. And I spent the last 15 months of the Carter administration working on the, the frozen assets that we did to try to get some leverage on returning the Iranian hostages and providing some support to then Deputy Secretary of State Warren Christopher and the negotiations there. And so just by the sort of accident of time and place, what I, my whole focus then turned to this international arena and the challenges of trying to engage and advance U.S. interests on the international platform. And, you know, it just it's it lit a spark in me that I hadn't really thought about much before, but I saw this as a, as a direction that I could be excited about and wanted to pursue. And boy, you pursued it. You went back to school, you, uh, you learned a lot, and then you moved up very quickly. So you worked in a number of the most important foreign policy jobs in the U.S. government. Uh, during your time in the Clinton and Obama administrations, you served as Deputy National Security Advisor, Director of Policy Planning, and then Deputy Secretary of State. So President Clinton and President Obama were similar in certain respects and different in others. Can you give our listeners a couple of anecdotes that captures the way these leaders worked? Well, first, you know, I just got to say, Hank, you know, that it's such a privilege to be able to serve at that kind of level in the U.S. government and to work with great leaders. I mean, I, I think that I think everybody can have a general sense of appreciation, but 
you know, the challenges and the difficulties of being president of the United States are truly extraordinary. You know this well, right? And we've been privileged to have many great people, uh, you know, serve in that role. And I've been privileged to serve with two great presidents and honored to be able to do so. They're very different, as you can imagine. I don't think it would come as a surprise to anybody to say they're very different in their styles and their approach. I think, you know, we, we all know President Clinton. He's very gregarious. He's very people oriented. And one of the things that he was especially effective in was using his own personal relationships to advance the American agenda and his personal relationship with great leaders like Francois Mitterrand, with Helmut Kohl, with Tony Blair, with so many others, with uh, Cardozo in Brazil, was such an important part of his style. And he understood these leaders as being not just leaders, but also politicians. They all also you know, rose to power, Yeltsin, for that matter. And he had a great sense of empathy for the, the political circumstances and the challenges facing the other leaders that he worked with. And I think that you know, was an important part of his success, whether it was Rabin and Arafat or dealing with the, the Northern Ireland peace process or so many of the other uh, challenges that he had to work for. That personal understanding of the way leaders think and act and, and the environment. President Obama, very different, very cerebral, very analytic, very, very thoughtful. You know, one could understand, you know, that part of his his growing up was not just that he had been an activist and a, and a social organizer, but also a professor. And I, I certainly get that since I'm one of those. He, he loved the Socratic method. He loved to challenge people on their assumptions to really, you know, get understanding the logic of people's underlying positions, the assumptions that they brought to it. So very, very different styles, but both uh, great leaders. Now, looking back on your time in government, which of your accomplishments gives you the most satisfaction? You worked on a lot of important things. And so maybe that's an impossible question. There's so much that is rewarding. And I, as you say, I mean, I just, it's like asking who's your favorite child, right? They're, they're all my favorite children. And, but I, I have to say, because I work in the national security area, the, the, the war and peace issues tend to dominate. And so being involved in places where you've been able to do something to bring peace and, and to end conflict, I think has a special resonance. So for me, the top of the list would be our work in the Balkans, first through the Dayton Accords to, to end the, the war in Bosnia, and second to to deal with the problem of ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. I think, you know, where, where the United States had to play an indispensable role and that we, after some back and forth, did step up to the plate and help to bring that end to, to two very, very uh, bloody conflicts there was particularly rewarding. And then the, the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, which was, again, you know, a long-standing conflict that many people felt was just beyond resolution and endemic. Um, and yet, through the great work of George Mitchell and President Clinton and all the extraordinary people in Northern Ireland, in the Irish Republic and in Great Britain, to help bring that about and the, the rewards of seeing that happen. And that great moment when I was in the Oval Office with President Clinton at know, two or three o'clock in the morning after the deadline had expired for the negotiations on the Good Friday Agreement and John Hume, the late great John Hume, uh, called President Clinton. The phone got patched through to the Oval Office, and and John Hume said, "Mr. President, we have a deal." And and you know, just feeling that sense of satisfaction is quite extraordinary. It gives me goosebumps just hearing about it because it was that was that was a major, major moment. Now moving along, you've had a, a number of careers, you know, <laughs> and and so now after leaving government. You've become the dean of the Maxwell School at Syracuse, and more recently, dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins. First of all, help our listeners understand, describe Johns Hopkins size for our listeners. First of all, it's a great legacy. You know, it was, it was created and conceptualized by Paul Nitz and Christian Herter at the end of World War II with a recognition that we were going to need a whole different kind of sets of talents uh, in particularly in the federal government and around the, the particularly national security and, and foreign affairs to deal with the challenges of the, the post-war world uh, and the, the immense complexity of the issues that we were going to have to create. And so there was a great sense of, of the need to have a strong connectivity between creative thinking, imaginative thinking, new solutions, but things that could be translated into the real world. I mean, these were obviously statesmen themselves who were creating the school. And so that piece of understanding that you need innovative ideas, but practical connection to policymaking has always been a huge part of the of what Johns Hopkins Science has, has always been about. It's also something I know you'll appreciate is it's always had a very strong commitment to 
strong economic training, even for those of our students who are not going to go into specifically economically oriented careers. We, we do have a lot of people who go to Treasury, the fund, the bank, and, and, and private institutions. But even for our people who go into other areas of foreign affairs, there's a strong conviction that you need to understand the basics of economics, how markets work, how trade works, and the like, that you can't deal with any of the issues without understanding the economic component. And so our students are especially well prepared in that sense as well. Tell us about your philosophy of education and the changes you're ushering in at Johns Hopkins Sice. For us, it's important to remember that we are a professional school, that our students have come all from great colleges and, and they've had an opportunity to do the kind of learning that I strongly believe in. I believe it for undergraduates, a liberal arts education is the best preparation for being a good citizen and having a full and, and rich life. But we are a graduate school. And so it's a very different mission because we are now preparing people for professional careers. And so the idea is turning ideas into action. That's what we're all about, which is you need the ideas, you need the, the intellectual capital to be able to be effective out in the world, but it's not an abstraction. It's not a debating society. It's a question of how do you get things done? And so our job and my philosophy is to have the school be a place in which students who come because they're very motivated to make a difference, develop the tools and the skills that they need, not only to deal with the first challenge that they're going to have when they come out of graduate school, but for the rest of their lives. So these are these are not just knowing what's happening today. It's not about sort of imparting knowledge. It's, a, it's a, about imparting ability to take knowledge, to learn, and to probe, to ask the right questions, to be imaginative about solutions. So it's that kind of action-oriented set of skills that's at the heart of what makes a good professional school successful, and that's what we're trying to do. And we're also, I think, very focused on trying to adapt that to the changing world. People need a different set of skills and abilities to deal with the mid 21st century than they needed to deal with the 20th century when Herder and Nitzsch started the school. So I mentioned economics, technology. Our students need to be sophisticated about technology. They don't have to be coders. They don't have to be, you know, people who are creating artificial intelligence or synthetic biology, but they need to understand the broader social, economic, political security ramifications of these new emerging issues. So that's where we can make a difference. And that's what our mission is really about. And it's a big mission. Now let's talk about some of today's global challenges. We'll start with China. Jim, because this is an area where you and I have spent a lot of time. Uh, I've really got to know you through China and discussing China, and I see you as a real expert here. So President Biden and Xi Jinping's meeting, let's talk about that, the, the meeting in, in November at the G20, which uh, seemed to signal some minor progress in the relationship. What was your takeaway how do you assess the current state of U.S.-China uh, relations? Well, thanks. thanks. And thanks for all that you've done uh, in terms of, of both in your service in government on U.S.-China relations, but also in your continuing to, to discuss and provide good advice to the administration and the world on these issues. I mean, I'm not sure I've used the word progress to describe what happened, but I think it was a very important moment in the relationship, because I think that the most important thing that came out of the meeting was a signal from both of the leaders, one, that they understood the danger of the continued deterioration of the relationship. And they sent a signal to their own home constituencies that both of them were prepared to put some effort into trying to avoid that. And that's a good sign. I, I'm especially focused on the sign within China that President Xi was saying to his team, you know, that we are not looking for a conflict with the United States. And that makes it possible for the people who work in the system to, to re-engage with the United States at a time before when there was uncertainty about whether the Chinese leadership even saw any value in engaging with the United States. So that signal that, that President Xi gave and his language about understanding the dangers. And then, of course, Similarly, on our side, the President Biden making clear that understanding we have deep, profound differences, that there is a, an appreciation of the risk of just unconstrained rivalry, competition, whatever word you want to use, and that there was a responsibility of the leaders, that there was agency here for the leaders to try to do something about that. So that signal is very important. Now, progress requires them to actually take that signal and do things. With it. That, that remains to be seen. Jim, I agree with you that this was an important moment, Biden and she's sitting down and, and changing the tone. But uh, 
you know, how do you assess the current state of the U.S.-China relationship? And when you look at America's strategy toward China, what could we be getting wrong? What risks do you see with our present policies? I think the state of relationship is very fraught at the moment. If you would ask me this just before the meeting, I would say that that my assessment was that both sides were close to giving up on the other one, that both sides had concluded that the other one was not interested in developing a constructive relationship, that both sides had resigned themselves basically to a, a long-term twilight struggle, just like the Cold War, in which there was really no meaningful opportunity to have a different direction. That uh, I think our the assessment on the U.S. side was that China was hopelessly expansive and aggressive, uninterested in in having any kind of serious cooperative relationship with the United States or to accepting that it needed to work within the international system. And on the Chinese side, a growing sense that the U.S. was implacably hostile to China and China's interests and would do anything it could to thwart China's economic development, its political influence and the like. And so you get we were getting to the point once each side has given up on the prospect of constructive engagement, then th there's no bottom under, under the relationship. There's just a risk that it's it becomes an all-out competition that can easily turn into conflict. So that, I think, was the direction that we were going. As I said, I, I saw the meeting as a signal that maybe both sides were beginning to perceive the dangers of that. And so optimistic is too strong, but I, I do hope that everybody takes advantage of this to recalibrate. Because I think the problem right now is that we have broadly accepted this idea that the relationship with China is a competition. And I know that many people say, oh, competitions are very benign and it's just like the Olympics or the World Cup. But the fact is that in the zero sum world of international politics, competition is zero sum. And that if we see the world as one in which our, the other side's gains are our loss, uh, then we have to do a lot to, towards the, each other that is damaging to the other. And it's very hard to put boundaries or guardrails, the way the administration wants to say, on the relationship when you define the relationship as zero sum, in which one side is going to win, it's going to be vigorous competition and the like. And so, you know, it is the sense of, of saying, seeing the relationship almost exclusively in zero sum terms that I think has been the danger of the way the administration has framed this idea of competition. We've got to recognize that each side is committed to protecting the security and prosperity of its own people, that each side has a profoundly different view about how to do that, and that these differences are profound, right? That we believe the way to protect the prosperity and the security of the American people is by a free and open society in which people are allowed to make their own choices. The Chinese are Leninist. They don't believe that. They believe that a leading party should make these decisions, that the history of China is that the absence of a strong leading central power has, has led to China being weak and poor. And so the leadership has, has bought in, I'm not sure the Chinese people have bought in, to this vision. So that conflict is baked in. But we still have to understand that even though we disagree how they're doing it, the fact that they want to achieve security and prosperity for their people is understandable. And so we have to find a way to express our understanding that their objectives are not necessarily hostile to ours, even though the way they pursue them could be very damaging and threatening to us. Well, very well said. Now, I'd like to talk about third rail here, the issue of Taiwan. You've written that there are powerful reasons to sustain the one China policy, but equally powerful reasons to adapt it to meet the realities of today. First, describe for our listeners the one China policy, which has been a key part of peaceful economic progress in the Asia Pacific region, and tell us how you come out and whether it needs to evolve. Problem with slogans and shorthands is that people think they know what these things mean, and it often obscures rather than clarifies the debate. Because, you know, when you say one China, but for many people who aren't steeped in the details and the history, it sounds like, well, that means you're just accepting that Beijing should control Taiwan. But that's not the case. What we call the one China policy is actually a policy which is much more nuanced than that, which is basically that there is an understanding that the resolution of the differences between Beijing and Taipei uh, can only be resolved peacefully and with the consent of, 
of the parties on both sides of the straits. That is, it's a commitment to, to be open to a range of solutions, but no use of force or coercion, and that each side has to accept whatever is the ultimate outcome of the resolution. That was the principle that has guided U.S. policy uh, from the beginning, that, that we would not, the U.S. would not try to impose a solution on the problem, but it would insist that each side approach this peacefully and without coercion. Right? And so that is critically important and without unilateral actions by either side, that they would, things would be done with the consent of people on both sides of the straits. And that's so important because there are issues that are very profoundly different between people on both sides of the straits. But as long as there is a commitment to try to find common ground, each side can defend its own interests and yet recognize that the other side has a stake in the outcome as well. And that's very important for the United States, right? Because we need to have whatever the difference and whatever the resolution be one that is not one that is achieved by force. Now, when I say it has to be adapted is because how we did that, right, in the long term. So we agreed when with normalization under President Carter that we would no longer have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan and we would not have a separate independent recognition of Taiwan as a separate country. But we also uh, agreed that we could have informal relationships with Taiwan across a range of things. And in, in today's environment, the ability to sustain this idea of a peaceful future without coercion on either side depends on the Taiwanese people having enough sense of security that they don't feel that they can be coerced by Beijing. And there are two ways that Beijing can coerce Taiwan. One is militarily, that's obvious. And so we, we have committed to provide defensive military equipment to Taiwan. But the greater danger is that, that Taiwan could be coerced uh, economically. And so for me, the key evolution here is that we've got to understand that the long-term ability of Taiwan to be an equal partner with Beijing in resolving this question requires the ability for Taiwan to be vigorously prosperous and, and secure economically. So building stronger economic ties with Taiwan, for me, is every bit as important as having more military engagement, because we have to do some on the military side, but that's not going to solve the problem. It's going to make the people of, of Taiwan feel more secure about living with this very odd status quo, is if they feel that they're not at the risk of being economically coerced by Beijing. And when you look at all the tools that China has, this is a big challenge. So I've always said to those that are predicting an invasion, saying there's a lot of other tools that China has short of an invasion. So you and I agree. Now, let, let's move to another huge issue, the Russia-Ukraine war. This is clearly a world-changing event. And when I recognize, Jim, that it's very difficult to predict how and when it will end. But how do you see this playing out? And how do you evaluate the risks and what is the most constructive role, you know, that America can play and American diplomacy can play here? You know, I think as we look at this, as you say, it is it is a, a game changing event. And, and I think the the issue about standing firmly against the unacceptability of, a, of military aggression of the kind that, that Russia has engaged in here is really important. But we also need to recognize that there are a lot of conflicts around the world that have similar characteristics, which are still unresolved after even decades of time. I mean, think about Korea, right, where we're still living in the world of an armistice that took place after the North Korean aggression um, uh, against uh, the South. And so we need to be very clear that, that we are not and should not validate what Russia had done. Frankly, what it did in 2014, every bit as much as what it did um, uh, this year. At the same time, we have to recognize that coming to a solution is not going to be easy. And, and trying to solve this solely through military force is also a very dangerous thing, because although you know, I have great support for the idea that, that we need to stand behind the idea that Ukraine is entitled to full control over its territory, simply trying to achieve this through a military victory may, in the end, not produce the result which everybody wants to see, which is, which is the restoration of Ukrainian sovereignty. And so we have to think about a long-term strategy here in which the strong principle remains clear. No acceptance of the aggression, no peace agreement that sort of allows Russia to, to claim legitimacy of its, of its invasion, but at the same time recognize that it may take a long time 
to work out a resolution here and how do we manage the conflict as it goes forward so that the conflict doesn't either cause huge humanitarian suffering or risk the security and, and, and well-being of the neighboring countries. So it, it, it is likely to be a long-term prospect, one in which we have to be clear about the principle, but pragmatic about how we achieve that in recognizing that there's not a simple end of war where there's a parade and everybody declares victory. The world's never going to be the same again, given the size of this. I do agree that a simple solution looks very unlikely, right? And a quick solution looks very unlikely. Jim, let's close our conversation today with your advice to our younger listeners. What advice do you give students who are navigating their lives and careers in today's rapidly changing world? Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a fitting end of our conversation because it really takes me back to where we started, which is my own biography, right? And that is, you know, to be open to to new opportunities and new challenges. It's fine to have some sense of where where your direction is going to be and the kinds of things that you'd like to achieve, but new things pop up all the time, and it's very hard to control the trajectory of your career. When something happens and you see that it's sort of outside the main line of what you thought you were going to do, don't immediately dismiss it. There are new opportunities. There are new things that that you may never have considered before. They may prove to be the most rewarding thing that you've ever done. Try new things. Look at different paths. Expand your horizons. Create peripheral vision around your opportunities. That's number one. Number two, work with good people, right? The mentors are the single most important thing you can have. I have had an extraordinary group of mentors. You've heard some, Tom Atkins, the first black city councilor, Kevin White, the very courageous mayor uh, of Boston, working for the judge that I worked for, David Baslon, one of the great jurists of all time, my five years with Senator Kennedy, and then of course, President Clinton, President Obama, so many other mentors, Sandy Berger, Madeleine Albright, These are the people who will make the difference in your life. So even if the job sounds interesting, put yourself in a place where you can work and learn from people who will inspire you, who will teach you, who will engage with you, and use that as a way to to enrich and expand yourself. And then, of course, as you move on, to, to remember to do the same as you move up the ladder to the people who come from behind you. Well said, Jim. And and your career has been a very interesting roadmap or model for those that are looking to the future? Well, it's been a great journey. I mean, I've been very privileged. I've been thinking back over it, you know, taking on this new job and working with young people. Um, You know, I I, I look back at myself when I was a student and say, you know, if you could have said, then would you be happy with where you are today? And I can say unequivocally, yes, I've been very fortunate in that respect and had the privilege of working with people like you. And that's really tremendously rewarding. Jim, you are having a great career. It's far from over. We've covered a lot of ground today, and you've given our listeners a lot to think about. So thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been great. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.